Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about the electrons and the atoms, section 4.2. So, let's get started. The development of the atom we've discussed in the past, from Dalton all the way up to Niels Bohr, where Dalton stated that the atom was actually a solid sphere. Um, then we had J.J. Thompson who discovered the electrons, Ernest Rutherford discovered the um, nucleus, and then we have Niels Bohr who developed the model for the hydrogen atom. His big question was where are the electrons? And we've been asking that question ever since. So for about 200 years now we're wondering where are the electrons? So Niels Bohr stated that the electrons are in definite fixed orbits. The fixed orbits have the electrons at a specific energy level with a fixed distance from the nucleus. Now we know from Niels Bohr's um, experiments that the amount of energy the electron possesses depends on its distance from the nucleus. So the further away, the more energy the electron has. Now, Niels Bohr's model worked perfectly for the hydrogen atom but it failed all tests with any atom that had more than one electron. So we went back to the drawing board. Now in the video that you saw the other day with Brian Green, you saw the double slit experiment where we are treating electrons with a dual wave particle nature. So we went back to the drawing board and Erwin Schrodinger who was an Austrian physicist, came up with a mathematical treatment of these electrons. He treated them as if they were waves. And only waves of specific energies and therefore frequencies provided solutions to these equations. Now this is all about giving up the idea that electrons are only particles we have to consider that the electrons also act like waves. There's another scientist, his name was Werner Heisenberg. And Werner Heisenberg stated that there's a fundamental limitation to how precisely both the position and the momentum of an electron can be known. The mere act of looking for the electron actually changes its position and its velocity within the electron within the atom. So we have a little bit of an issue here. We don't know specifically where the electron is located. However, we can talk about the probability of finding an electron anywhere in a three-dimensional space. So within that three-dimensional space, we can look at the wave equation that Schrodinger came up with and look at the high probability of the location of the electron. It's all about probability. So we have a new model of the atom called the quantum mechanical model. Quantum mechanics describes the motion of small particles confined to a tiny region of space. The exact position of an electron at any given instant is not specified. And the exact path that the electron takes cannot be specified. Now, here's the thing. In Bohr's model, we had a two-dimensional region of space where the electron is, could be located. Now, we have a three-dimensional region a sphere that is very different from the two-dimensional orbital. Now, the electron can be anywhere within that sphere. It's all about probability. The electron is found inside a blurry electron cloud. Somewhere in that sphere, the electron is located. It's an area where there is a chance of finding an electron. Now the quantum mechanical model 
The electron does not travel around the nucleus in neat orbits of fixed energy like Bohr proposed. They exist in certain regions called orbitals. An orbital is a 3D region around the nucleus that indicates the probable location of an electron. Here's some pictures of some atomic orbitals. They have different sizes and different shapes. You have an S orbital that's spherical around a XYZ coordinate plane. And then you have a PX orbital there that is laying on the x-axis and it kind of looks like a figure eight and a py orbital that is the same shape as the px orbital and it also has that figure eight shape except its orientation is on the y-axis and you got a pz orbital which has that figure eight shape we often call them the dumbbell shape that is on the z-axis. So if you put all the p orbitals together, it kind of looks like a funky flower. We'll have more to come on what atomic orbitals look like, sizes of atomic orbitals, so forth and so on. So, according to Bohr again, electrons of increasing energy occupy orbits farther and farther from the nucleus. Schrodinger's equation also accounts for quantized energies for electrons. So let's talk about these atomic orbitals and quantum numbers. The electron's energy level is not the only characteristic of an orbital that is indicated by solving Schrodinger's equation. Quantum numbers specify the properties of atomic orbitals and the properties of electrons in orbitals. Now, there's, a, there's four different quantum numbers that we're going to be working with. They're the answers to Schrodinger's equation. The crazy math that's involved in quantum mechanics is beyond the scope of high school chem chemistry. So, We'll be working specifically with the answers to Schrodinger's equation. The first three quantum numbers are a result from solutions to Schrodinger's equations. These first three quantum numbers, they indicate the main energy level, you know, whether it's in the first energy level, the second energy level, or way up here in the sixth or seventh energy level. It indicates the shape which is that S and P shape, and there's others. And the orientation, which is whether they're on the x-axis or the y-axis, or whether it's a sphere and it's encompassing all three axes, that's what orientation is. And then we'll talk about the fourth, which is not an answer to Schrodinger's equation, but has been randomly assigned by scientists to indicate the spin direction of an electron whether it's spinning in one direction or another direction. 